But when we base truth upon the word of God, God determines what truth is. And that is where we need to seek the truth, is in the word of God. Because man is fallible. But God's truth is everlasting. And if that is the thing that holds everything together, shouldn't our truth be based upon the word of God, and not what man says, or even the gap theory how it came about. Well, if this is science, then somehow we need to mesh it with the word of God and make it fit. No, that's not the way it is. God's word is God's word. God's word is truth. And that's all there is to it. It doesn't matter what man says. So our entire armor is held together by this belt. And how is our armor maintained? Through prayer and the power of the Holy Ghost. We find that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. If someone wants to read that. Ephesians 6 and 18. So Paul talks about the armor, and then he talks about prayer. How is our armor maintained? Through prayer. How do we build our faith? Through prayer and experience and pushing it to the test. How do we grow uh, in the Word of God? Through prayer. You realize we can read the Bible all we want, but if we never pray about what we've read, if we never pray about what we've studied, it doesn't become a part of us. It doesn't become applied to our life. As a minister, the most important part of the preaching aspect is not the words coming out of my mouth, per se, but it's what happens around the altar. If people really take it to prayer, I can preach the Word of God. I can preach it verbatim how He wants. But if the person that it's meant for does not pray about it, it's not going to be everlasting. You realize that individual could sit in the pew, grabbing over the pew, they could feel the word of God, um, power of the Holy Ghost convicting them, they could be weeping, they could be crying, they could come to the altar for five minutes, but if they do not solidify that message for them, if they do not do what God wants them to do right then and there, and take it to them in prayer, it could be of no avail. God can keep working on them in that area. But it was at that point in time, if they would have made it right, they wouldn't have kept struggling. They would have kept feeling um, conviction. They wouldn't keep feeling um, doubt or maybe the fact that, oh, I messed up again. If they would have just solidified it in prayer. Because prayer is where the Word of God becomes real in our life and is there where we apply it to our lives and either allow it to change us or we allow it to fall on the stony soil and the birds come and pluck it out or it just falls by the wayside. It is prayer, through prayer where our, our armor is maintained and strengthened. For the soldier who goes to war, what is one thing that they want when it comes to their armor? They want strong armor. They want something that's almost impenetrable. They want something that allows them to move freely through maybe the experience of chain armor. But they want it to be maintained. They want it to be strengthened. It is in prayer where that happens for us. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But if we allow them to, they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons are not forged by us. They're forged by God. For us. He is the creator of our armor. He is the one that fashioned and designed it. If man designs an armor, or any piece of armor, could that armor be flawed? Could that sword not be as sharp as it's supposed to be? <coughs> maybe if it's a prentice, maybe there's a nick in the sword somewhere where it shouldn't be. Maybe the tip's a little bit more blunt than it should be. Or maybe if he's melting down the armor, 
Maybe there's a section that didn't quite get as thick as the other part and now is a weak spot in the arm. Or maybe in chainmail. Maybe he's putting those links together and maybe one link didn't completely latch and seal. Maybe he didn't get it completely welded. Well, what's the weakest part of a chain? The weakest link. And all it takes is one arrow to hit that and maybe all his armor comes falling off or all the chain mail falls off. Why? Because man forged it and there was a weakness that he did not see. There was a flaw. But when God makes something, he makes it perfect. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He created the trees. He created the birds. And what does the Bible say that God looked down and viewed his creation and he considered it in what state? It was perfect. It was without flaw. Before sin entered into the world, everything was perfect. Nobody got sick. No one died. You didn't get a headache. The dogs didn't come biting after your ankles. <laughs> everything was perfect. It's because of sin that things become flawed. And when we try to do things our own way, they get flawed. Why? Because we don't allow God to work them out the way that he's supposed to. Or the, the way that he wants to, I should say. But we hinder. If we allow ourselves to get in the way when God's forging our weapons and trying to teach us, we're hindering God. But everything God does is perfect. If we would just step back and allow God to work our life, if we would do something that is so hard, and that is be obedient to the will of God. Be obedient to his voice. Even when it seems unnecessary, even when it seems something that's ridiculous or out of the norm, if we're obedient, God will fashion that armor that the enemy cannot penetrate it. He will fashion that armor that we'll know how to use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Just because you have a weapon doesn't mean you know how to use it. Ever see somebody with a piece of technology that is grand and spectacular? But the person working it has no idea what they're doing. Or, and that can be anything. It really could be. The person who gets behind the steering wheel for the first time and thinks it's, it's a race car and they have to go like this as they're going down the road to keep it straight. <coughs> the person who thinks they have to floor the gas to get the car going. The person who holds the nail up to the wall, takes his hand back to hit it, lets go of the nail to hit it, and the nail flops to the floor. I mean, it can be anything. But when we allow God to get in the mix, when we allow him to show us and teach us, that's when our weapons become effective and useful. It's not just a matter of having the weapons. You can have all the information in the world, but if you do not have the wisdom to apply it, it's ineffective. You can hop on the internet, go on YouTube, Google, you can look at something you don't understand how to do, maybe electric work, carpentry, work on vehicles. But if you do not understand it, all that information is of no avail. It doesn't really do much of you, for you. In fact, sometimes it does more harm than it does good. Why? Because we don't understand it. We don't know how to use it. We don't know how to apply the information that we're given. If we are going to be effective using the armor of God, it's going to be when we study the word of God, allow God to teach us, and allow his wisdom to enter into us, and allow him to teach us how to become effective using the weapons and the armor. Because our enemy is real. This battle that we're in is war is real. The war is real. And the enemy is out to kill, steal, and destroy. But God's given us armor and weapons that we may overcome. And not just any, because they're not fleshly, they're not carnal. But they're effective against the enemy and his attacks if we know how to use them. And how do we learn how to use the armor and the weapons? In prayer. 
If you get a new piece of the technology or equipment, if you don't know how to use it, what do you do? You go to the manual. We have the manual. But even that, greater than that, we have the designer, we have the architect, and we can call them up and talk to them at any time. But it comes down to us and whether or not we're willing to, whether or not we're willing to pay the price, and if we've learned the voice of God. He said, his sheep know my voice. But there are three voices in this world that we have to be careful of. Because if we're not careful, we can be led astray by our own voice and our own thoughts. And we can be led astray by the voice of the enemy who likes to disguise his voice as our voice. Any thoughts, any questions, anything anyone wants to add at this point? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, making himself visible if he so chooses, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead you upon the string instruments, upon vocal cords, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. Anoint the pastor as he brings forth your word today. Anoint his mind and his lips that he may bring forth your message. That your words that you have desired for us come forth. That we may be drawn closer to you than ever before, Lord. That we may know you like never before. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.